What defines the late game in League of Legends? When does it arrive? Does it come when players are maxed out in levels and items? Does it come when the game has gone over 35 minutes? Or does it come when the death timers become excruciatingly long? Well, all of those answers are technically correct. Depending on the person you ask, they may have a different way of defining when the late game starts. For me, I believe that late game begins when things that were priorities in earlier stages of the game are no longer top priorities. Taking down champions, turrets, epic monsters such as dragon and baron, farming up on minions. These are priorities that provide advantages to win the early or mid game. However, if the game ever reaches a point where these advantages mean little to nothing, then we can now say we have officially entered the late game. At this stage, going for objectives may increase your chances of winning, but they will by no means guarantee victory. At the end of the day, it will come down to who can teamfight better, who can come clutch in high pressure situations, and who can find the path to destroy the Nexus. Vision can help to better facilitate many of these things, which is what I will be focusing on in this video. So just like my previous videos on early and mid game vision control, we need to know what role vision plays in the late game. Basically, vision in the late game is there to facilitate the team fights, the backdoors, the baron steals, and anything necessary to finish the game. Teams will want to set up or deny wards around areas that are most likely to have some sort of action. To get a more specific idea, we will take a look at three examples from competitive play. One from the LEC, one from the LCS, and one from the LCK. In the first example, we'll be taking a look at a game from the LEC between Origin and Rogue in their playoffs round. In this game, we will see what happens when one team is unprepared to fight for an objective due to their lack of vision. At 42 minutes into the game, we see that Origin have accumulated a 9k gold lead over Rogue. However, it being the late game, the gold discrepancy means little. If you take a look at the items on both teams, all the players that need gold have basically maxed out on their items. The gold difference becomes noticeable in the items between the junglers and the top laners. But because Rogue opted into a team composition that revolves around peeling and empowering the affiliates with the Orn, Jarvan, and Tom Kench, all of whom build as tanks, their items are cheap but highly efficient. So if either team clashes in a straight up 5 vs 5 team fight, the outcome can go either way. The dragon is spawning in 10 seconds, and it will serve as the ocean's soul buff if either team manage to secure it. But if we look at the state of the map, Rogue have no vision whatsoever both in their own jungle and also in the river. On the other hand, Origin managed to ward everywhere necessary to allow them to start this objective with ease. How was Origin able to move into Rogue's jungle and place all those wards there? It mainly had to do with the way Origin played around their Baron buff. Minutes before the dragon spawned, the two teams fought over the Baron buff and Origin were able to secure it, losing only Pantheon in the process. Then, Origin began to siege the three lanes and simultaneously started to ward everywhere to facilitate the siege. All of those wards Origin placed were actually very useful because not only did they help protect the players from any advances by Rogue, but also because they served a dual role in preparing Origin for the Dragon Soul. Origin's wards hit two birds with one stone there, and Rogue was unable to do anything about it. Rogue now have to move into the Fog of War to contest for the Dragon Soul, which at this point is almost a suicide attempt from them. Origin start the objective, knowing Rogue have to come fight them for it. The way Origin set up the teamfight is almost too perfect to believe it happened. Alfari's Aatrox and Destiny's Nautilus prepares to flank Rogue from the sides. New Azir, Upset's Misfortune and Xerxes' Pantheon are in a position to take the dragon and zone Rogue from accessing it. Out of desperation, Inspired's Jarvan and Finn's Orn attempt to get into the pit. With the two tanks far away, the backline is now exposed to the flanking Aatrox and Nautilus. What happens next is history. I'll let you see the rest of the teamfight now. Simple. He's in the pit! Now or lose. It's a smite fight! Smite fight! Who's gonna pick it up? That's a knock up onto Xerxes! And Xerxes! He gets it! He wins the challenge! He wins the ocean, and that means there's no soul point for Rogue. Now all of a sudden in the fight, this nuke tech that's gone down is at the cost of Vanda. So has Hans Summer. The damage is out. Upset and Alfari reign supreme. Upset is untouched, and he is looking to run down Lawson. He's going to strut oh, his man. way up. And the grand 
Origin played the late game extremely well there. They knew exactly how to set up Vision in order to facilitate their team fighting around the dragon. From Rogue's perspective, approaching the dragon was indeed their only choice, but they should have not separated themselves like the way they did there. Orn and Jarvan were supposed to protect and peel the Athelios so he can output as much damage as possible. Without a reliable frontline, Aatrox had literally the best time of his life flanking with Nautilus. I think the right decision would have been to give up the dragon entirely and attempt to mechanically outplay the opponent somehow. At that point in the game, getting the dragon soul isn't the goal, but staying alive or killing the enemy to ensure that at least the game isn't over? That was what should have been in Rogue's minds instead. We have seen how Origin was able to teamfight better than Rogue with superior vision control in the late game. Now moving on to the next example, we'll be taking a look at a game from the LCS between Evil Geniuses and FlyQuest in their playoffs round. In this game, we will see why it is important to know the location of everyone in the late game. So to begin with, let's analyze the game state. At 38 minutes, we see that Evil Geniuses has a 5k gold lead over FlyQuest. Just like the previous example where I talked about how the gold discrepancy means very little in the late game, the 5k gold lead Evil Geniuses have doesn't do much here. What's more important actually is that they managed to break the mid and bot inhibitor along with one of the nexus turrets of FlyQuest. This opens the possibility to start the Baron which is spawning in a few seconds and also pressure the lanes with a back door. FlyQuest somehow managed to get the Dragon Soul with 4 stacks of the same Drake which should give them an edge in their team fights. However, Evil Genius's team composition consists of Talia and Pantheon, two champions that have ultimates that will allow them to move from one location to another in a matter of seconds. So FlyQuest must have this in mind because their base is susceptible to getting backdoored while the rest of Evil Geniuses go for the Baron. So how must both teams utilize their vision in this scenario? For Evil Geniuses, they need to make sure they can pinpoint the location of all of the members of FlyQuest. They should place wards around the Baron and they should push out the mid lane wave since minions also grant vision. This way, Talia and Pantheon can start pressuring the base of FlyQuest without getting collapsed on if FlyQuest decide to have most of their members defend the base. From FlyQuest's perspective, they need to respond by making sure their base is safe from going down which means that the best choice in this case would be to give up Baron. Even if the Baron is taken, it's not like the game is automatically over, although it will make it harder for FlyQuest to get back into the game. But there is no clear way that they will be able to contest for the Baron while simultaneously trying to defend their base. FlyQuest should just focus their vision around the next objective that spawns, which is the Elder Drake. Contesting for Baron while trying to protect such a vulnerable Nexus is the wrong decision, but they opt into it anyways. Evil Geniuses knows their wind conditions, so they decide to start the Baron and pressure a back door. FlyQuest leave one member to defend the base, but that clearly was not enough to stop Evil Geniuses from ending it. Pantheon and Talia used their ultimates to push out the remaining Nexus turret and managed to almost secure the win for Evil Geniuses. It doesn't really matter though because FlyQuest somehow lost 3 members in their attempt to stop Evil Genius from getting the Baron. FlyQuest had 4 Dragon Stacks with the Soul, an almost full item Aatrox, and a Corky and Aphelios who will continue to scale into the late game. The right choice to make is to force 5 vs 5 teamfights before the game is over. They should have theoretically just outright won with their team composition advantage. Evil geniuses have no reliable way to access the backline of FlyQuest other than to brute force themselves through the frontline of Sejuani, Nautilus, Aatrox who have an extra 24% armor and magic resistance from the dragon stacks. Anyways, to conclude this segment, I think Evil Geniuses did a good job utilizing the information gained from Vision to know exactly where FlyQuest was and closed out a difficult late game. We have now arrived at our final example of the day between Hanwha Life and Genji. In this game, we will see why it is important for teams to fight around their vision. Everyone knows the rules. To begin with, let's take a look at the game state. At 36 minutes and 30 seconds, we can see that both teams are as close as they can be, as the gold lead, the dragons taken, and the turrets destroyed are identical. 
If we take a look at the team composition, Gen.G have gone for a strong front-to-back draft with heavy engage and team fighting. Hanwha Life went for more of a skirmish type draft, although I am honestly confused why they picked the Kale there. She doesn't really provide much value in the early game, and against Genji's draft, I can't imagine her able to output damage with all the long range engage and crowd control. But regardless, they managed to make it this far into the game, and now Kale is level 17, where she has already reached her true power spike as a champion. The Ocean Drake is spawning in 30 seconds, and if Hanwha Life secure it, they will gain a big fighting advantage with the Ocean Soul. Knowing this, Genji do their best to secure vision around this objective and possibly obtain the soul for themselves when the next dragon spawns. So at this moment, Genji are in full control to take the dragon, since Hanwha Life have to face check to get wards in the river. If anyone gets too close to the objective, Genji will have eyes on them and they can pull the trigger to start a team fight. Accessing the dragon pit will be extremely difficult for Hanwha Life, let alone fighting in that area with no vision. So taking all of that into account, there should be no possible way Genji could screw their plan and give up the Ocean Soul, right? I'll let you see for yourself. Witness the power of the number one team in the LCK. Super big mistake. They just need to let Zoe do every. Okay, well that I guess that's, that's a bullet time. All right, yeah, Cube almost just dying straight up as Lahans doesn't have the door. He's gonna be knocked up as the bubble is gonna go wide. Cube ults and gets no value. Is now Hanwha trying to get back Ooh. in there. Oh, Lava was interrupted. Is now Cube able to flash, uses the Cataclysm against Gen G. Is now Ruler diving on forward. He looks for Cube, but he can't get him. Cube is now able to auto attack in this back line as BDD is running as fast as his little legs will carry him. And only one to die on the side of Hanwha Life. This might be the turn that they were looking for as Lava goes back to his distortion. And that is a very dead on up on the top side of the map and it's only BDD to try and save this game for Gen.G. Yeah, and you can see the teleport going down into bottom. That's gonna be the Ocean Soul picked up by Hanwha Life, and that is disastrous right now. MF or Ruler needs to sell. Holy moly, what were Gen.G thinking there? All of the work they put into setting up for the dragon went to waste because they thought it was a good idea to boneheadedly engage in the open and chase after Hanwha Life into the darkness of the river. Everything that went wrong there was because they opted into a team fight in an area where they had no vision to begin with. Genji had zero wards there to help them. Zero. The Jarvan flashing and ulting into Hanwha Life was the most Leroy Jenkins type of engage I've seen in a while. Truly disastrous. Also watch this depressing play by Ruler's Misfortune who attempts to kill QV's Kale but fails miserably because she couldn't see her in the bush. I'm just so confused as to why they would start the engage there. They had all of the visions set up around the dragon, but refused to play around it. If we remember the previous example where Origin had all of the visions set up to obtain their dragon soul, you can see a night and day difference in the decision making between the two teams. Origin played the team fight perfectly around the objective, while Gen G unanimously decided to not even think about the vision they secured. It's very disappointing to see the number one team in Korea have such questionable decision making against a bottom tier 7th place Hanwha Life. Anyways, Hanwha Life coming ahead on that team fight allowed them to obtain the Ocean Soul, perhaps the most powerful of all the Dragon Souls. And now the game has become extremely difficult for Gen G. They can certainly try to make a team fight work, but at this point, I feel like they were mentally out of it. In their final moments, Genji attempted another questionable engage in the mid lane that was amazingly botched again, giving Hanwha Life the momentum they needed to close out the game. So to wrap it all up, we saw three examples where teams had to utilize Vision to help them win during the late game. In the game between Origin vs Rogue, we witnessed a textbook example of how Origin had full control of an area with their superior vision, which made it hard for Rogue to approach an important objective and come out ahead during a team fight. In the game between Evil Geniuses and FlyQuest, we saw how Evil Geniuses used wards and the minion wave to know exactly where the members of FlyQuest were at the time, to attempt a risky but calculated backdoor that led them to their victory. 
And finally, between Hanwha Life and Genji, we saw how an example of what will happen if a team ignores the vision they set up in the late game and decide to blindly teamfight in the darkness of Fog of War. Hope you have learned something today. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this type of content, make sure to subscribe. I hope all of you are doing okay in this pandemic crisis, so stay safe and I will see you next time.